The Adventure of the Naval Treaty. John? Ah, Mary, come in. I have no scheduled patients for the entire day. You've been in here all morning. I assumed you'd been seeing patients. No, I had a uh, a report to write up. Oh, I should have known. You would not be satisfied until your latest adventure with Mr. Holmes was fully chronicled and ready for publication. Fully chronicled, yes, but not for publication. No, I fear that the adventure of the second stain deals with interests of such importance and implicates so many of the first families in the kingdom that the new century will have come before the story can be safely told. A oh, pity. But safety and security first. Oh, the post came just a moment ago. There are several letters addressed to you. Hmm. <laughs> Great Scott. What is it, John? A letter from an old schoolfellow of mine, a Percy Phelps. I don't believe you've ever mentioned him, although his name sounds familiar to me. Isn't he the nephew of Lord Holdhurst? Yes. A connection that did him little good in school. <laughs> Poor Percy. But it was another thing when he came out into the world. Much the same age as myself, though he was two classes ahead of me. He must have been an exceptional student. Oh, quite a very brilliant boy. He won a scholarship that sent him on to a triumphant career at Cambridge. I heard vaguely that his abilities and the influence which he commanded had won him a good position at the Foreign Office. He had passed completely out of my mind until now. I wonder what he could possibly be writing to me about. Briarbury, Woking. My dear Watson... I have no doubt that you can remember Tadpole Phelps, who was in the fifth form when you were in the third. It is possible even that you may have heard that, through my uncle's influence, that I was in a situation of trust and honor, until a horrible misfortune came suddenly to blast my career. There is no use writing the details of that dreadful affair. In the event of your acceding to my request, it is probable that I shall narrate them to you. I have only just recovered from nine weeks of brain fever, and am still exceedingly weak. Do you think that you could bring your friend, Mr. Holmes, down to see me? I should like to have his opinion of the case, though the authorities assure me that nothing more can be done. Do try to bring him down, and as soon as possible. Every minute seems an hour while I live in this state of horrible suspense. Assure him that if I have not asked his advice sooner, it was not because I did not appreciate his talents, but because I have been off my head ever since the blow fell. Now I am clear again, though I dare not think of it too much for fear of a relapse. I am still so weak that I have to write as you see by dictating. Do try to bring him. Your old schoolfellow, Percy Phelps. Poor old chap. Of course I must do all I can to help him. Holmes will be just as eager to help him as Percy will be to receive it. Yes, not a moment must be lost in laying the matter before him. Right. So murder my assistant. He can manage my practice while I'm away. Dr. Watson! How good to see you. Come in, come in! How are you, Mrs. Hudson? Well enough, sir. How is Mrs. Watson? Oh, quite well. She sends her compliments. Is uh, is Holmes in? I, it depends on what you mean by in. He's conducting another one of those chemical investigations of his. He dips into this bottle and then into that bottle, and I don't know what all. It's beyond me. But I am certain he will see you. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. <clears throat> Morning, Holmes. Watson, you come at a crisis. If this litmus paper remains blue, all is well. If it turns red, it means a man's alive. Aha! I thought as much. I will be at your service in one instant, Watson. I have several telegrams to dispatch. A very commonplace little murder. You've got something better, I fancy. You are the stormy petrel of crime, Watson? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Ah, Mrs. Hudson. I have several telegrams that need to be sent immediately. Of course, sir. I'll send Peter out directly. (sighs) Now, Watson, 
What is it? A letter I received from an old schoolfellow of mine, uh, Percy Phelps. Let's have a look at it. It does not tell us very much, does it? Yet the writing is of interest. But the writing is not his own. Precisely. It is a woman's. A man's, surely. No, a woman's. And a woman of rare character. You see, at the commencement of an investigation, it is something to know that your client is in close contact with someone who, for good or evil, has an exceptional nature. My interest is already awakened in this case. If you are ready, we will start for Woking at once and see this diplomatist who is in such evil case and the lady to whom he dictates his letters. In little under an hour, we found ourselves among the firewoods and heather of Woking. Briarbury proved to be a large detached house standing in extensive grounds within a few minutes' walk of the station. On sending in our cards, we were shown into an elegantly appointed drawing room where we were joined in a few minutes by a rather stout man who received us with much hospitality. I'm so glad you've come. Percy's been inquiring for you all the morning. Poor old chap. He clings to any straw. His father and mother asked me to see you, for the mere mention of the subject is very painful to them. We have had no details yet. I perceive that you are not a member of the family. Well, I never... <laughs> of course, you saw the J.H. monogram in my pocket watch. For a moment there, I thought you'd done something clever. <clears throat> Joseph Harrison is my name, and as Percy is to marry my sister Annie, I shall at least be a relation by marriage. You'll find my sister in his room, for she has nursed him hand and foot these two months back. Perhaps we'd better go in at once, for I know how impatient he is. The chamber into which we were shown was on the same floor as the drawing room. It was furnished partly as a sitting and partly as a bedroom, with flowers arranged daintily in every nook and corner. A young man, very pale and worn, was lying upon a sofa near the open window, through which came the rich scent of the garden and the balmy summer air. A woman was sitting beside him, and roses be entered. How are you, Watson? I should never have known you under that moustache, and I dare say you would not be prepared to swear to me. This, I presume, is your celebrated friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I introduced him in a few words, and we both sat down. Joseph Harrison had left us, but his sister remained, with her hand in that of the invalid. I won't waste your time. I'll plunge into the matter without further preamble. I was a happy and successful man, Mr. Holmes, and on the eve of being married, when a sudden and dreadful misfortune wrecked all my prospects in life. I was, as Watson may have told you, in the Foreign Office, and through the influence of my uncle, Lord Holdhurst, I rose rapidly to a responsible position. When my uncle became Foreign Minister in this administration, he gave me several missions of trust, and as I always brought them to a successful conclusion, he came at last to have the utmost confidence in my ability and tact. Nearly ten weeks ago, to be more accurate, on the 23rd of May, he called me into his private room, and after complimenting me upon the good work which I had done, he informed me that he had a new commission of trust for me to exercise. This is the original of that secret treaty between England and Italy of which, I regret to say, some rumors have already got into the public press. It is of enormous importance that nothing further should leak out. The French or Russian embassies would pay an immense sum to learn the contents of these papers. They should not leave my bureau were it not that it is absolutely necessary to have them copied. You have a desk in your office. Take the treaty and lock it up there. I shall give directions that you may remain behind when the others go, so that you may copy it privately. When you have finished, relock both the original and the draft in the desk, and hand them over to me personally tomorrow morning. I took the papers and... Excuse me an instant. Were you alone during this conversation? Absolutely. In a large room? Thirty feet each way. In the center? Yes, about it. And speaking low? My uncle's voice is always remarkably low. I hardly spoke at all. Thank you. Pray go on. Six o'clock. I'd begun to doubt its existence. A welcome relief, eh, Garou? I usually find it so, but not tonight. Tonight it reminds me that I shall have to stay late and work longer than I'd hoped. I fear I have fallen behind in my work. 
It won't take long, I hope. Not if I can help it. Are you staying in town this evening, Phelps? Uh, for dinner. Joseph Harrison and his brother is in town this evening. He plans to travel back to Woking on the 11 o'clock train, and I mean to join him. Well, I'm hoping for the 7.15 train. Fortunately, the commissioner is at his post today. He should have coffee brewing at his spirit lamp this evening, in case this work takes longer than I expect. When I returned from dinner, he was gone. I instantly began my pressing business. As I examined the treaty, I saw at once that it was of such importance that my uncle had been guilty of no exaggeration in what he had said. Without going into details, I may say that it defined the position of Great Britain toward the Triple Alliance, and foreshadowed the policy which this country would pursue in the event of the French fleet gaining a complete ascendancy over that of Italy in the Mediterranean. The questions treated in it were purely naval, and written in the French language. At the end were the signatures of the high dignitaries who had signed it. I glanced over it, and then settled down to my task of copying. Nine articles. Just nine articles to show for all this time. How many have I left? Uh, well, there is little chance of my catching the eleven o'clock. <sighs> Coffee. Perhaps that will clear my mind. The commissionaire remains all night in a little lodge at the foot of the stairs. I rang the bell, therefore, to summon him. Yes, sir. I'm Mrs. Tangy, the commissioner's wife. I do the jarring here. Can I help you? A cup of coffee, if you will. Yes, sir. I wrote two more articles, then, feeling more drowsy than ever... I rose and walked up and down the room to stretch my legs. My coffee had not yet come, and I wondered what the cause of the delay should be. Opening the door, I started down the corridor to find out. There was a straight passage, dimly lit, which led from the room in which I had been working. There is no other way to enter or exit my office but through this passage. It ended in a curving staircase with the commissioner's lodge in the passage at the bottom. Halfway down this staircase is a small landing, with another passage running into it at right angles. This second one leads, by means of a second stair, to a side door used by servants, and also as a shortcut by clerks when coming from Charles Street. Here is a rough chart of the place. Thank you. Yes, I think that I quite follow you. It is of the utmost importance that you should notice this point. I went down the stairs and into the hall, where I found the commissioner fast asleep in his box, with the kettle boiling furiously. Bless me, I must have... Mr. Phelps, sir. I came down to see if my coffee was ready. I was brought in the kettle when I fell asleep, sir. But if you was here, then, then who rang the bell on the call box? The bell? What bell is it? It's the bell of the room he was working in. Then someone... Quick! A cold hand seemed to close round my heart. I ran frantically up the stairs and along the passage. There was no one in the corridors, Mr. Holmes. There was no one in the room. The papers! They're gone! The papers? The copy is here, but the original is gone. Well, we met no one on the stairs or along the passage. The thief must have come up the stairs from the side door. He can't conceal himself anywhere in this room. Make haste to Charles Street, Commissioner. We both rushed along the corridor and down the steep steps which led to Charles Street. The door at the bottom was closed, but unlocked. We flung it open and rushed out. I can distinctly remember that as we did so, there came three chimes from a neighboring church. It was a quarter to ten. Now one's in. None except the usual traffic in Whitehall. There is a policeman down the street. He may know something. Sir! How may I help you, Governor? A robbery has been committed. A document of immense value has been stolen from the Foreign Office. Has anyone passed this way? I've been standing here for a quarter of an hour, sir. Only one person has passed during that time. A woman, tall and elderly, with a paisley shawl. Well, that's only my wife. 
Has no one else passed? No one. Then it must be the other way that the thief took. Certainly. We must hurry for to catch him. Which way did the woman go? I don't know, sir. I noticed her pass, but I had no special reason for watching her. She seemed to be in a hurry. How long was it? Oh, not very many minutes. Within the last five? Well, it could not have been more than five. You're only wasting your time, sir. And every minute now is of importance. Take my word for it. My own woman nothing to do with it. And come down to the other end of the street. Well, if you are, I will. Stay. Where do you live? Number 16, Ivy Lane, Brixton. But don't let yourself be drawn away upon a false scent, Mr. Phelps. Come to the end of the street. Let us see if we can hear of anything. Nothing can be lost by following his advice, Mr. Phelps. Perhaps a lounger could give us a word of direction. What lounger would stand at a street corner on a night like this? It, perhaps we missed something, a vital clue at the office. We do well to search the place again. We returned to the office and searched the stairs and the passage without result. The corridor which led to the room was laid down with a kind of creamy linoleum which shows an impression very easily. We examined it very carefully, but found no outline of any footmark. Had it been raining all the evening? Since about seven. How is it then that the woman who came into the room about nine left no traces with her muddy boots? I am glad you raised the point. It occurred to me at the time. The charwomen are in the habit of taking off their boots at the commissioner's office and putting on slippers. That is very clear. There were no marks then, though the night was a wet one? None. The chain of events is certainly one of extraordinary interest. What did you do next? We examined the room. There is no possibility of a secret door, and the windows are quite thirty feet from the ground. Both of them were fastened on the inside. The carpet prevents any possibility of a trap door, and the ceiling is of the ordinary whitewashed kind. I will pledge my life that whoever stole my papers could only have come through the door. How about the fireplace? They use none. There is a stove. A bell rope hangs from the wire just to the right of my desk. Whoever rang it must have come right up to the desk to do it. But why should any criminal wish to ring the bell? It is a most insoluble mystery. Certainly the incident was unusual. What were your next steps? You examined the room, I presume, to see if the intruder had left any traces, a cigar end or a drop glove or hairpin or other trifle? There was nothing of the sort. No smell? Well, we never thought of that. Ah, a scent of tobacco would have been worth a great deal to us in such an investigation. I never smoke myself, so I think I should have observed it if there had been any smell of tobacco. There was absolutely no clue of any kind. The only tangible fact was that Mrs. Tangy had hurried out of the place. I'll tell you, sir, Mrs. Tangy's part in this mystery is of no matter. Can you give any explanation why she would leave in a hurry? No, but it is the time when she always went home. But that doesn't We mean... are wasting precious time with all this needless speculation. We must act. Commissioner, run down and hail a hansom. Then go to Scotland Yard and ask for a detective to meet us here at the Foreign Office. Yes, sir. Mr. Phelps? I believe our best plan of action would be to seize this woman before she has a chance to get rid of the papers, presuming she even has them. She will be on foot and we'll be in a hansom. We will in all likelihood reach her house before she does. This is the address the commissioner gave us, Mr. Forbes. At least someone is home. Yes, sir? I'm looking for Mrs. Tangy. I believe she lives here. She does, sir. I'm her eldest daughter. Is your mother at home? No, but I expect her home soon. Won't you come in and wait in the front room, gentlemen? Ten minutes. Where can the woman be? Mother, there are two men in the house waiting to see you. I, I can't see them. What is it, mother? Quick! We mustn't let her destroy the papers! We ran into the back room, or kitchen, but the woman had got there before us. She stared at us with defiant eyes, and then, suddenly recognizing me, an expression of absolute astonishment came over her face. 
Why, if it isn't Mr. Phelps from the office! Come, come. Who did you think we were when you ran away from us? I thought you were the brokers. We've had some trouble with the tradesmen. That's not quite good enough. We have reason to believe that you have taken a paper of importance from the foreign Mother. office and that you ran in here to dispose of it. You must come back with us to Scotland Yard. What? You can't arrest me. I ain't done nothing wrong. Me husband, he's the commissioner at the foreign office. You I've can been... have your say later after you've been thoroughly searched and questioned. Question? No. Mr. Phelps, did you check the fire? Nothing. No papers have been burned lately. Nothing seems to be amiss in this entire kitchen. After a careful examination of the room, we drove to Scotland Yard. Once there, Mrs. Tangy was handed over to a female searcher. I waited in an agony of suspense until she came back with her report. There were no signs of the papers. Then, for the first time, the horror of my situation came in its full force upon me. Hitherto, I had been acting, and action had numbed thought. I had been so confident of regaining the treaty at once that I had not dared to think of what would be the consequence if I failed to do so. But now there was nothing more to be done, and I had leisure to realize my position. It was horrible. Watson there will tell you that I was a nervous, sensitive boy at school. It is my nature. I thought of the shame which I had brought upon my uncle, myself, upon everyone connected with me. No allowance is made for accidents where diplomatic interests are at stake. I was ruined. Shamefully, hopelessly ruined. I don't know what I did. I fancy I must have made a scene. I have a dim recollection of a group of officials who crowded round me, endeavouring to soothe me. One of them drove down with me to Waterloo and saw me into the Woking train. Dr. Ferrier, who lives near me, was going down by that very train. He most kindly took charge of me, and it was well he did so, for I collapsed in the station, and before we reached home, I was practically a raving maniac, as Miss Harrison here can testify. You can imagine the state of things, Mr. Holmes, when Dr. Ferrier arrived with Percy. We were roused from our beds by the doctor's ringing. Mrs. Phelps and I were distraught at Percy's condition. Dr. Ferrier heard only enough from the detective to give us an idea of what had happened. It was evident to all that I was in for a long illness. So Joseph was bundled out of his cheery bedroom and it was turned into a sick room for me. Here I have lain, Mr. Holmes, for over nine weeks unconscious and raving with brain fever. If it had not been for Miss Harrison and for the doctor's care, I should not be speaking to you now. She has nursed me by day, and a hired nurse has looked after me by night. Slowly, my reason has cleared, but it is only during the last three days that my memory has quite returned. Sometimes I wish that it never had. The first thing that I did was to wire to Mr. Forbes, the Scotland Yard detective who has charge of the case. He came out and assured me that though everything has been done, no trace of a clue has been discovered. The commissioner and his wife have been examined in every way, without any light being thrown upon the matter. The suspicions of the police then rested with young Garreau, who, as you may recall, was the last clerk to leave the office. His remaining behind and his French name were really the only two points which could suggest suspicion. Yet, I did not begin work until he had gone. His people are of Huguenot extraction, but as English in sympathy and tradition as you and I are, nothing was found to implicate him in any way, and there the matter dropped. I turn to you, Mr. Holmes, as absolutely my last hope. If you fail me, then my honor and my position are forever forfeited. Your statement has been so explicit that you really leave me very few questions to ask. There is one of the very utmost importance, however. Did you tell anyone that you had this special task to perform? No one. Not Miss Harrison here, for example? No. I had not been back to Woking before getting the order and executing the commission. And none of your people had by chance been to see you? None. Did any of them know their way about the office? Oh, yes. 
All of them had been shown over it. Still, of course, if you said nothing to anyone about the treaty, these inquiries are irrelevant. I said nothing. Do you know anything of the commissionaire? Nothing, except that he is an old soldier. One regiment. Oh, I have heard. Uh, cold stream guards. Thank you. No doubt I can get the details from Forbes. The authorities are excellent at amassing facts, though they do not always use them to advantage. Do you see any prospect of solving this mystery, Mr. Holmes? Well, it would be absurd to deny that the case is a very abstruse and complicated one, but I can promise you that I will look into the matter and let you know any points which may strike me. Do you see any clue? You have furnished me with seven, but of course I must test them before I can pronounce upon their value. You suspect someone? I suspect myself. What? Of coming to conclusions too rapidly. Then go to London and test your conclusions. Your advice is very excellent, Miss Harrison. I think, Watson, we cannot do better. Do not allow yourself to indulge in false hope, Mr. Phelps. The affair is a very tangled one. I'll come out by the same train tomorrow, though it's more than likely that my report will be a negative one. God bless you for promising to come. It gives me fresh life to know that something is being done. Uh, by the way, I have had a letter from Lord Holdhurst. Ha! What did he say? He was cold, but not harsh. I dare say my severe illness prevented him from being that. He repeated that the matter was of the utmost importance, and added that no steps would be taken about my future, by which he means my dismissal, until my health was restored and I had an opportunity of repairing my misfortune. Well, that was reasonable and considerate. Come, Watson, for we have a good day's work before us in town. Poor fellow has certainly got himself into very deep water, and it's a question whether we shall ever be able to get him ashore. What do you think of Miss Harrison? A girl of strong character. Yes, but she is a good sort, or I am mistaken. She and her brother were the only children of an ironmaster somewhere up Northumberland Way. He got engaged to her when travelling last winter, and she came down to be introduced to his people with her brother as escort. Then came the smash, and she stayed on to nurse her intended, while Joseph, finding himself pretty snug, stayed on too. I've been making a few independent inquiries, you see, but today must be a day of inquiries. But my practice... Oh, if you find your own cases more interesting than I mine... I was going to say that my practice could get along very well for a day or two. Excellent. Then we'll look into this matter together. I think we should begin by seeing Forbes. He can probably tell us all the details we want until we know from what side the case is to be approached. You told Phelps you have several clues? Yes, but we can only test their value by further inquiry. The most difficult crime to track is the one which is purposeless. Now, this is not purposeless. Who profits by it? There is the French ambassador, there is the Russian, there is whoever might sell it to either of these, and there is Lord Holdhurst. Lord Holdhurst? Well, it is just conceivable that a statesman might find himself in a position where he was not sorry to have such a document accidentally destroyed. Not a statesman with the honorable record of Lord Holdhurst. It is a possibility, and we cannot afford to disregard it. We shall see the noble lord today, and find out if he can tell us anything. Meanwhile, I have already set inquiries upon foot. Already? Yes, I sent wires from Woking Station to every evening paper in London. This advertisement will appear in each of them. A ten pound reward. Number of the cab which dropped a fare at her about the door of the Foreign Office in Charles Street to quarter to ten in the evening of May 23rd. Apply 221B Baker Street. Are you confident that the thief came in a cab? If not, there is no harm done. But if Mr. Phelps is correct in stating that there is no hiding place either in the room or the corridors, then the person must have come from the outside. If he came from outside on so wet a night, and yet left no trace of damp upon the linoleum, which was examined within a few minutes of his passing, then it is exceedingly probable that he came in a cab. Yes, I think that we may safely deduce a cab. It sounds plausible. It may lead to something. 
And then, of course, there is the bell, which is the most distinctive feature of this case. Why should the bell ring? Was it the thief that did it out of bravado? Was it someone who was with the thief who did it in order to prevent the crime? Or was it an accident? Or was it... He sank into a state of intense and silent thought. But it seemed to me, accustomed as I was to his every mood, that some new possibility had dawned suddenly upon him. After a hasty luncheon, we pushed on at once to Scotland Yard. Holmes had already wired to Forbes, and we found him waiting to receive us. What steps have you taken? Tangy, the commissioner, has been shadowed. He left the guards with a good character, and we can find nothing against him. One of our women shadowed Mrs. Tangy, but she could learn nothing. When we questioned Mrs. Tangy here in Scotland Yard, we learned more. Give me a full report of your cross-examination. I understand that you have had brokers in your house. I won't deny it, sir. We've been able to pay him off, though. Where did the money come from? It was from Mr. Tangy's pension. Why did you answer the bell instead of your husband when Mr. Phelps rang for coffee? He was very tired. He's been working many long hours at the office. I wanted to relieve him. Why did you hurry away from the office tonight? Your haste attracted the attention of the police constable. I was later than usual and I wanted to get home to my family. How is it that Mr. Phelps, who started at least 20 minutes after you, arrived at your home 10 minutes before you? That's the difference between walking and taking a hansom. If your reason is as innocent as you claim, why, upon reaching home, did you run into the back kitchen? I kept money in the kitchen. Money I was saying to pay off the brokers. Did you see or meet anyone loitering about Charles Street when you left the office? I saw no one but the constable. Truly, sir. She has at least an answer for everything. You seem to have cross-examined her pretty thoroughly. What else have you done? The clerk, Garreau, has been shadowed all these nine weeks, but without result. We can show nothing against him. Anything else? Nothing. No evidence of any kind. Have you formed any theory about how that bell rang? Well, I must confess that it beats me. It was a cool hand, whoever it was, to go and give the alarm like that. Yes, it was a queer thing to do. Many thanks to you for what you have told me. If I can put the man into your hands, you shall hear from me. Come along, Watson. Where are we going to now? To interview Lord Holdhurst, the cabinet minister and future premier of England. We were fortunate in finding that Lord Holdhurst was still in his chambers at Downing Street, and on home sending in his car, we were instantly shown up. The statesman received us with that old-fashioned courtesy for which he is remarkable. Standing on the rug between us, with his slight tall figure, his sharp-featured thoughtful face, and his curling hair prematurely tinged with grey, he seemed to represent that not-too-common type, a nobleman who is in truth noble. Your name is very familiar to me, Mr. Holmes, and, of course, I cannot pretend to be ignorant of the object of your visit. There has only been one occurrence in these offices which would call for your attention. In whose interest are you acting, may I ask? In that of Mr. Percy Phelps. Ah, my unfortunate nephew. You can understand that our kinship makes it the more impossible for me to screen him in any way. I fear that the incident must have a very prejudicial effect upon his career. But if the document is found? That, of course, would be different. I had one or two questions which I wished to ask you, Lord Holdhurst. I shall be happy to give you any information in my power. Was it in this room that you gave your instructions as to the copying of the document? It was. Then you could hardly have been overheard. It is out of the question. Did you ever mention to anyone that it was your intention to give out the treaty to be copied? No. I am absolutely certain of that. Well, since you never said so, and Mr. Phelps never said so, and no one else knew anything of the matter, then the thief's presence in the room was purely accidental. He saw his chance, and he took it. You take me out of my province there. There is another very important point which I wish to discuss with you. You feared, as I understand, that very grave results might follow from the details of this treaty becoming known? Very grave results, indeed. And have they occurred? Not yet. If the treaty had reached, let us say, the French or Russian Foreign Office, you would expect to hear of it? I should. Since nearly ten weeks have elapsed then, and nothing has been heard, 
It is not unfair to suppose that, for some reason, the treaty has not reached them. We can hardly suppose, Mr. Holmes, that the thief took the treaty in order to frame it and hang it up. Perhaps he is waiting for a better price. If he waits a little longer, he will get no price at all. The treaty will cease to be a secret in a few months. That is most important. Of course, it is a possible supposition that the thief has had a sudden... illness? An attack of brain fever, for example? I did not say so. And now, Lord Holdhurst, we have already taken up too much of your valuable time, and we shall wish you good day. Every success to your investigation, be the criminal who it may. He is a fine fellow, but he has a struggle to keep his position. He is far from rich and has many calls. You noticed, of course, that his boots have been resold. Now, Watson, I won't detain you from your legitimate work any longer. I shall do nothing more today unless I have an answer to my cab advertisement. But I should be extremely obliged to you if you would come down with me to Woking tomorrow by the same train which we took today. We found our client the next morning still under the charge of his devoted nurse, but looking better than before. He rose from the sofa and greeted us without difficulty when we entered. Any news? My report, as I expected, is a negative one. I have seen Forbes, and I have seen your uncle, and I have set one or two trains of inquiry upon foot which may lead to something. You have not lost heart, then? By no means. God bless you for saying so. If we keep our courage and our patience, the truth must come out. We have more to tell you than you have for us. I hoped you might have something. Yes, well, we have had an adventure during the night, and one which might have proved to be a serious one. Do you know that I begin to believe that I am the unconscious center of some monstrous conspiracy, and that my life is aimed at as well as my honor? Hmm. Pray continue. It sounds incredible, for I have not, as far as I know, an enemy in the world. Yet, from last night's experience, I can come to no other conclusion. Are you certain, Percy? You can manage without the nurse tonight? I am certain. And you are certain you needn't take the draft Dr. Ferrier prescribed for you? Quite. I assure you, my dear Annie, I am on the mend. (laughs) Very well. I shan't argue with you. Nonetheless, you must not hesitate to ring in case you should need anything. This is your first night to sleep without the nurse in the room. I shall be fine, Annie. I am much improved. I think a good portion of it is due to Watson and Mr. Holmes. They have given me hope. Perhaps very soon this entire sordid affair will be behind us. I pray so, Percy. Good night. Good night, Annie. About two in the morning, I had sunk into a light sleep, when I was suddenly aroused by a slight noise. It was like the sound a mouse makes when it is gnawing at a plank, and I lay listening to it for some time, thinking little of it. Then it grew louder, and suddenly there came from the window a sharp metallic click. I sat up in amazement. There could be no doubt what the sound was. The faint ones had been caused by someone forcing an instrument through the slit between the sashes, and the second by the catch being pressed back. There was a pause for about ten minutes, as if the person were waiting to see whether the noise had awoken me. Stop! Stop! Uh, Joseph! Annie! Quick! There's someone trying to break into the house! Percy, what is it? Where's Joseph? Whatever's the matter, Percy? What is the row about, Percy? Joseph, a man was just at my window. He may still be out there. He was trying to break in. He can't have got far. Martin! Sit down, Percy. You're you're trembling. If only I was stronger, I could have followed him. I should never have consented to allow you to spend the night without the nurse. I'll be all right, Annie. If only Joseph can catch him. Did you notice anything about this visitor that might give us some kind of clue? Not really. It was all so quick. I flung open the shutters, but he was gone like a flash. 
He was wrapped in a cloak. It covered the lower part of his face. One thing I am sure of. He had some weapon in his hand. Surely not! A knife. I distinctly saw the gleam of it as he turned to run. Oh, Percy! Any sign of the man, Joseph? No such luck, old chap. Martin and I will thoroughly search the grounds at first light. Did you find anything? We did meet with moderate success. Martin and I examined the flower bed outside the window. But uh, the weather has been so dry lately that it's hopeless to follow the trail across the grass. However, there is a place on the wooden fence next to the road where the top of the rail was snapped off, as if someone had tried to scramble over it. We must wait, then, until Mr. Holmes returns from London. Annie is right. We will say nothing to the police until we have seen Mr. Holmes. This tale of our clients appeared to have an extraordinary effect upon Sherlock Holmes. He rose from his chair and paced about the room in incontrollable excitement. Misfortunes never come singly. You have certainly had your share. Do you think you could walk round the house with me? Oh, yes. I should like a little sunshine. Uh, Joseph will come. Hmm, and I also. I'm afraid not, Miss Harrison. I think I must ask you to remain sitting exactly where you are. She resumed her seat with an air of displeasure. Her brother, however, had joined us, and we four set off together. There, as you can see, Mr. Holmes, are the marks in the flower bed. But hopelessly blurred and vague. I don't think anyone could make much of this. Let us go round the house and see why this particular room was chosen by the burglar. I should have thought those larger windows of the drawing room and dining room would have had more attractions for him. They are more visible from the road. Ah, yes, of course. There is a door here which he might have attempted. What is it for? It is the side entrance, sir, for tradespeople. Of course, it is locked at night. Have you ever had an alarm like this before? Never. Do you keep anything in the house that might attract a burglar? Nothing of value. Hmm. Oh, by the way, Harrison, you found some place, I understand, where the fellow scaled the fence. Let us have a look at that. It's just this way. Ah, yes. Only a portion remains. Do you think that was done last night? It looks rather old, does it not? Well, possibly so. There are no marks of anyone jumping down upon the other side. No, I fancy we shall get no help here. Let us go back to the bedroom and talk the matter over. Percy was walking very slowly, leaning upon the arm of his future brother-in-law. Holmes walked swiftly across the lawn and was at the open window of the bedroom long before the others came up. Miss Harrison, you must stay where you are all day. Let nothing prevent you from staying where you are all day. It is of the utmost importance. Certainly, if you wish it, Mr. Holmes. When you go to bed, lock the door of this room on the outside and keep the key. Promise to do this. But, Percy? He will come to London with us. And I'm to remain here? It is for his sake you can serve him. Why do you sit moping there, Annie? Quick! Promise! Come out into the sunshine. Yes, I will. No, thank you, Joseph. I have a slight headache, and this room is deliciously cool and soothing. What do you propose now, Mr. Holmes? Well, in investigating this minor affair, we must not lose sight of our main inquiry. It would be a very great help to me if you would come up to London with us. At once? As soon as you conveniently can. Say, in an hour. I feel quite strong enough, if I can really be of any help. The greatest possible. Perhaps you would like me to stay there tonight? I was just going to propose it. Then if my friend of last night comes to revisit me, he will find the bird flown. We are all in your hands, Mr. Holmes, and you must tell us exactly what you would like to be done. Perhaps you would prefer that Joseph came with us to assist me. Oh, no. My friend Watson is a medical man, you know, and he will assist you. We'll have our lunch here, if you will permit us, and then we shall all three set off for town together. We can have our lunch out in the garden. It's a lovely day. Will you join us, Annie? Thank you, Percy, but I fear I must decline your offer as well. Perhaps after the heat of the day you will feel better, Miss Harrison. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Go on, Percy. I shall be fine. 
I know the ideal spot for our luncheon. It's uh, only this way, Doctor. Excellent, Miss Harrison. What the object of my friend's manoeuvres was, I could not conceive, unless it were to keep the lady away from Phelps. However, Holmes had a still more startling surprise for us. After accompanying us down to the station and seeing us into our carriage, he calmly announced that he had no intention of leaving Woking. You heard her right, Watson. There are one or two small points which I should desire to clear up before I go. Your absence, Mr. Phelps, will in some ways rather assist me. Watson, when you reach London, you would oblige me by driving at once to Baker Street with our friend here and remaining with him until I see you again. It is fortunate that you are old schoolfellows, as you must have much to talk over. Mr. Phelps can have the spare bedroom tonight, and I will be with you in time for breakfast. But how about our investigation in London? Oh, we can do that tomorrow. I think that just at present I can be of more immediate use here. You might tell them at Briarbury that I hope to be back tomorrow night. I hardly expect to go back to Briarbury. Goodbye. You have implicit faith in Holmes. I have seen him do some remarkable things. But he never brought light into anything quite so dark as this. Oh, yes. I have known him to solve questions which presented fewer clues than yours. But not where such large interests are at stake. I don't know that. To my certain knowledge, he has acted on behalf of three of the reigning houses of Europe in very vital matters. But you know him well, Watson. He is such an inscrutable fellow that I never quite know what to make of him. Do you think he is hopeful? Do you think he expects to make a success of it? He has said nothing. That is a bad sign. On the contrary. I have noticed that when he is off the trail, he generally says so. It is when he is on a scent, and is not quite absolutely sure yet that it is the right one, that he is most taciturn. Dr. Watson, I brought you the morning paper. I figured you would like to look at it. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. <clears throat> well, forgive me, I, I'm afraid I didn't sleep out at all. Oh, dear. And your friend? How is the poor man? I haven't seen him yet this morning. I doubt if he had a better night than I had. Oh, uh, when do you expect Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson? He said he would breakfast with us. I will bring up the meal when he arrives. Goodbye, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Watson, has Holmes returned? Not yet. He'll be here when he promised, and not an instant sooner or later. Yes, of course. I was cudgeling my brains all night concerning your case. As was I. Are you sure that the object you saw in the intruder's hand was not a housebreaker's jimmy? Oh, no. It was a knife. I saw the flash of the blade quite distinctly. But why on earth should you be pursued with such animosity? Ah, that is the question. Well, if Holmes took the same view, that would account for his action yesterday. Presuming your theory is correct, if he can lay his hands upon the man who threatened you, he will have gone a long way towards finding who took the naval treaty. It's absurd to suppose that you have two enemies, one of whom robs you while the other threatens your life. We will soon know. 221B, Baker Street. Thank you, driver. This is for your trouble, cabby. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Holmes! Dr. Watson said you would be back for breakfast. I'll bring it right up. Your hand! Oh, but no matter. I won't ask. You are in a hurry to speak with your client. I shall learn everything soon enough. Mrs. Hudson, might I have a word with you about the meal? Uh, of course, Mr. Holmes. His left hand, it was bandaged. He looked very grim and pale. Like a beaten man. I'm afraid you're right. I suppose, after all, the clue of the matter lies probably here in town. I don't know how it is, but I had hoped for so much from his return. Watson, Mr. Phelps. You are not wounded, Holmes. Tut, it is only a scratch through my own clumsiness. This case of yours, Mr. Phelps, is certainly one of the darkest which I have ever investigated. I feared that you would find it beyond you. It has been a most remarkable experience. 
That bandage speaks of adventure. Won't you tell us what happened? After breakfast, my dear Watson, remember that I have breathed thirty miles of Surrey air this morning. I suppose there has been no answer to my cabman advertisement? Well, well, we cannot expect a score every time. Here is the coffee and tea, gentlemen. I'll bring up the three covers in a moment. We drew up to the table, Holmes ravenous, I curious, and Phelps in the gloomiest state of depression. Mrs. Hudson brought in three covered dishes. Holmes uncovered a plate of curried chicken. Mrs. Hudson has risen to the occasion. Her cuisine is a little limited, but she has as good an idea of breakfast as a Scotchwoman. What have you there, Watson? Uh, Ham and eggs. Good. Uh, What are you going to take, Mr. Phelps? Curried fowl or eggs? Or will you help yourself? Thank you. I can eat nothing. Oh, come. Try the dish before you. Thank you. I would really rather not. Well, then, I suppose that you have no objection to helping me? Of course not. Mr. Holmes, this is... I I can't believe... uh, It really is. I can't believe it. I won't believe it. It's too good to be true. (coughs) Here, Phelps. There, there. It was too bad to spring it on you like this. But Watson here will tell you that I can never resist a touch of the dramatic. God bless you. You have saved my honor. Well, my own was at stake, you know. I assure you, it is just as hateful to me to fail in a case as it can be to you to blunder over a commission. I shan't let this document out of my sight. I've not the heart to interrupt your breakfast any further, and yet I am dying to know how you got it and where it was. I'll tell you what I did first and how I came to do it afterwards. After leaving you at the station, I went for a charming walk through some admirable Surrey scenery to a pretty little village called Ripley. There I had my tea at an inn and took the precaution of filling my flask and of putting a paper of sandwiches in my pocket. There I remained until evening, when I set off for Woking again and found myself in the high road just outside Briarbury after sunset. No one coming? Fence doesn't appear to be too high. Surely the gate was open. Yes, but I have a peculiar taste in these matters. I chose the place where the three fir trees stand, and behind their screen I got over without the least chance of anyone in the house being able to see me. I crouched down among the bushes on the other side and crawled from one to the other, witness the disreputable state of my trousers, until I had reached the clump of rhododendrons just opposite your bedroom window. There I squatted down and awaited developments. You've been in this room all evening, Annie. It's nearing 10.30. Won't you come to bed, dear? Thank you, Mrs. Phelps. I believe I will. Miss Harrison closed her book, fastened the shutters, and retired. I heard her shut the door and felt quite sure that she had turned the key in the lock. The key? Yes, I had given Miss Harrison instructions to lock the door on the outside and take the key with her when she went to bed. She carried out every one of my injunctions to the letter, and certainly without her cooperation you would not have that paper now. She departed then and the lights went out, and I was left crouching amongst the rhododendron bushes. The vigil was weary. Of course, it has the same sort of excitement about it that the sportsman feels when he lies beside the watercourse and waits for the big game. At times, I thought more than once that the clock had stopped. But at last... A moment later, the servant's door opened, and Mr. Joseph Harrison stepped out into the moonlight. Joseph? He was bareheaded, but he had a black cloak thrown over his shoulder so that he could conceal his face in an instant if there was any alarm. He walked on tiptoe under the shadow of the wall, And when he reached the window, he worked a long-bladed knife through the sash and pushed back the catch. Then he flung open the window, and putting his knife through the crack in the shutters, he thrust the bar up and swung them open. From where I lay, 
I had a perfect view of the inside of the room and of every one of his movements. He lit the two candles which stand upon the mantelpiece, and then he proceeded to turn back the corner of the carpet in the neighborhood of the door. Presently, he stooped and picked out a square piece of board, such as is usually left to enable plumbers to get at the joints of gas pipes. Ah, worth these nine weeks' wait. There. No one will ever be the wiser. He blew out the candles and walked straight into my arms as I stood waiting for him outside the window. Good evening, Mr. Harrison. Sherlock Holmes. I know what you've come for, but you shan't get it! He threw at me with his knife, and I got a cut over the knuckles before I had the upper hand of him. He looked murder out of the only eye he could see with when we had finished, but he listened to reason. You will see that it will be wise to give me the papers. Without further ado, you can only hurt your case if you resist more. Take them, then! I am much obliged, Mr. Harrison. <clears throat> what will you do now, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Nothing. You're free to leave. I have what I was after. Go. But I wired full particulars to Forbes this morning. If he is quick enough to catch his bird, well and good. But if, as I shrewdly suspect, he finds the nest empty before he gets there, why all the better for the government? I fancy that Lord Holdhurst for one, and Mr. Percy Phelps for another, would very much rather the affair never got as far as the police court. By Jove, do you tell me that during these long ten weeks of agony, the stolen papers were within the very room with me all the time? So it was. And Joseph? Joseph a villain and a thief? I am afraid Joseph's character is rather deeper and more dangerous than one might judge from his appearance. From what I have heard from him before I let him go, I gather that he has lost heavily in dabbling with stocks, and that he is ready to do anything on earth to better his fortunes. Being an absolutely selfish man, when a chance presented itself, he did not allow either his sister's happiness or your reputation to hold his hand. Your words have dazed me. The principal difficulty in your case lay in the fact of there being too much evidence. What was vital was overlaid and hidden by what was irrelevant. Of all the facts which were presented to us, we had to pick just those which we deemed to be essential, and then piece them together in their order, so as to reconstruct this very remarkable chain of events. I had already begun to suspect Joseph. Joseph Harrison and his brother is in town this evening. He plans to travel back to Woking, and I mean to join him. It was a likely enough thing that he should call for you upon his way to the train station, since he knew the foreign office well. And then... Joseph! Annie! Quick! There's someone trying to break into the house! Someone was anxious to get into the bedroom, in which no one but Joseph could have concealed anything. Joseph was bundled out of his cheery bedroom, and it was turned into a sick room for me. Later my suspicions all changed to certainties. This is your first night to sleep without the nurse in the room. Knowing that the room would be absent, the intruder could only be someone well acquainted with the ways of the house. How blind I've been. The facts of the case are these. Joseph Harrison entered the office through the Charles Street door, and knowing his way, he walked straight into your room the instant after you left. Percy? Finding no one there, he promptly rang the bell, and as he did, his eyes caught the paper upon the table. A glance showed him that chance had put in his way a state document of immense value, and in an instant he had thrust it into his pocket and was gone. A few minutes elapsed, as you remember, before the sleepy commissionaire drew your attention to the bell. It was just enough time for the thief to make his escape. He went to Woking by the first train and examined his booty. A treatise concerning the relationship between England and Italy. <laughs> what luck should such a small fortune be taken to the right people? But where to hide it? He concealed it in what he thought was a very safe place. There. Tomorrow, the French Embassy. What? But then came your sudden return. 
Joseph, come help! Percy! Something's wrong with Percy. Bring him into Joseph's room, Dr. Ferrier. From that time onwards, there were always at least two of you there to prevent him from regaining his treasure. The situation to him must have been a maddening one. But at last, he thought he saw his chance. He tried to steal in, but was baffled by your wakefulness. And you are certain you needn't take the draft Dr. Ferrier prescribed for you? I fancy that he had taken steps to make that draft efficacious, and that he quite relied upon your being unconscious. Of course I understood that he would repeat the attempt whenever it could be done with safety. It would be a very great help to me if you would come up to London with us. Perhaps you would like me to stay there tonight? Your leaving the room gave him the chance he wanted. To ensure he would not strike until I was prepared to meet him, I gave Miss Harrison an important mission. Let nothing prevent you from staying where you are all day. It is of the utmost importance. Then, having given him the idea that the coast was clear, I kept guard as I have described. I already knew the papers were probably in the room, but I had no desire to rip up all the planking in search of them. I let him take them, therefore, from the hiding place, and so saved myself an infinity of trouble. Is there any other point which I can make clear? Why did he try the window on the first occasion when he might have entered by the door? In reaching the door, he would have had to pass seven bedrooms. On the other hand, he could get out onto the lawn with ease. Anything else? You do not think that he had any murderous intention. The knife was only meant as a tool. It may be so. I can only say for certain that Mr. Joseph Harrison is a gentleman to whose mercy I should be extremely unwilling to trust. The Adventure of the Naval Treaty by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Featuring Joshua Steele as Sherlock Holmes, Thomas Troll as Dr. Watson, Brian Stearns as Percy Phelps, Benjamin Troll as Joseph Harrison, Shelley Spence as Annie Harrison, Evan Petzold as Lord Holdhurst and Garreau, Caleb Spence as Detective Forbes, Alexi Mullenpaar as Mrs. Tangy, Elizabeth Stearns as Mrs. Hudson, Hannah Fizer as Mary Watson, Alyssa Klein as the daughter of Mrs. Tangy. This production was directed and adapted by Caitlin Preuss. The Adventure of the Naval Treaty was mixed by Greg Preuss, Caitlin Preuss, and Angela Preuss. The original score was composed by Shelley Spence and Angela Preuss. Our sound recorders were Greg Preuss and Jim Preuss. Sound design and assistants were Caitlin Spence and Hannah Pfizer. This production is copyrighted by Lend Me Your Ear Productions and cannot be duplicated or